Hello, Keith Kaiser here again with another lesson from God's Holy Word. We're going through the Gospel according to Matthew. Today we're in Matthew 27. We're going to pick up our reading at verse 11, Matthew 27 and 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. And we've already seen in chapter 27 the priests and the elders of the people gathering together to put Jesus to death. They plot to put him to death. They bind him and lead him away and deliver him to Pontius Pilate. And then the scene changes to Judas Iscariot before some of those chief priests and elders who makes the confession, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. So even though they've plotted against the Lord Jesus and deliver him up, evidence comes their way that exonerates the Lord, that shows he is exactly who he claims to be, that he's he's innocent. He's never done anything worthy of death and he's perfectly righteous. In fact, we know he's not sinned. There's no sin in his mouth. There's no sin in him. And he knew no sin. And yet the Lord is delivered up to Pontius Pilate. So this is the opening hearing before Pilate as recorded by Matthew in verse 11. He stood before the governor. So we have the accused prisoner standing in the dock, as it were, as they say in the British legal system. And the first question is, are you the king of the Jews? Now that's the first order of business for Pilate to ascertain, is this man a political rival? Is he going to be a messianic figure in the sense that he's a revolutionary and he's trying to overthrow the Roman government? Is he a violent person that is trying to usurp authority or lead some sort of uprising against the government? And for obvious reasons, Pontius Pilate wouldn't want that to happen. He's the Roman procurator, or as it's often translated here, the governor. He's in charge of this province for Rome, and he has to keep the peace, the famous Pax Romana, the Roman peace, and he has to keep order there. And the Romans are very big on this sort of thing. That's why they have their legions of soldiers that they want to keep any kind of uprising down. This is, of course, what the high priest Caiaphas feared. He said that if there's an uproar among the people, the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. And that's why he said it's expedient that one man die for the sake of the people in John chapter 11. And so the first question is going to be, are you the king of the Jews? Now, John gives a little more detail when they bring him to Pilate and Pilate asked, what evil has he done? What's the charge? And they said, well, if he wasn't a malefactor, an evildoer, we wouldn't have brought him to you, which, of course, is no charge. I mean, just saying, trust us, he's a bad guy. You should execute him. That doesn't hold in many courts of the land, okay? Most courts, ancient or modern, wouldn't tolerate that kind of specious accusation. There has to be at least the semblance of, of some kind of proof of guilt, a credible accusation. So they eventually uh, make that contention that he's uh, one who says he's the king of the Jews and therefore is a danger politically to Pontius Pilate. Now we're going to see that too is specious. There's nothing to that accusation. But Jesus said, it is as you say. So that's interesting. The Lord agrees. I mean, insofar as it goes, Yes, he is the king of the Jews. He is the one who is descended from David, and he is the promised king who will sit on the throne of his father David, his ancestor according to his humanity. In other words, he'll sit on that throne and rule and reign until every enemy is put under his feet. Revelation, therefore, calls him king of kings and lord of lords. Not just king of the Jews, as he's styled here. That's the beginning. But also eventually king over the whole world. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth its successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore 
till moon shall wax and wane no more, the hymn says. And indeed, our Lord will reign and rule over this earth for the future thousand-year millennial kingdom. Uh, having said that, he says it's as you say. He doesn't amplify that, but his accusers don't stop. Verse 12 says, while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. So again, these stories are all focused around what the chief priests and elders are doing. They plot in the first story from verses 1 through 2. Then in verse 3, Judas goes before them and declares that he sinned in betraying innocent blood. And now here in verses 11 through 14, they're here accusing the Lord. But the Lord answered nothing. He's making no response. We know this fulfills that prophetic announcement that Isaiah 53 says, like a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened on his mouth. And frankly, he didn't need to. I mean, the accusations were incredible. They didn't match reality. I mean, he was not the kind of revolutionary one would imagine. Even his own brethren earlier in his ministry said, go up to the feast. No man seeks to be known and doesn't go and show himself openly. You know, the Lord was going up to the Feast of Tabernacles in John 7 secretly. And he had to tell the brethren and the half-brothers that he had there in Nazareth, your time is always ready, because they were believers. They were on the world's time clock. But he was on a different timetable, even his father's time. He would say, my time has not yet come. And so the Lord wasn't a politician. He wasn't going to go up and press the flesh and kiss babies and make speeches and glad hand people. That wasn't the Lord's shtick. He wasn't going to do that. And so they're here accusing him, but he answers nothing. And Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? I mean, are you not hearing this? Have you kind of zoned out? Are you what we might call catatonic? You know, that this is just so overwhelming to you that your mind is elsewhere as a defense mechanism. You're not listening to what they say. But it wasn't that the Lord was unaware. He not only heard their words, he could read their hearts. And they were testifying against him, which is an extraordinary statement when you think of it, that here are people that are Jews. Here are the subjects of the king of the Jews. These are chief priests and elders. In other words, they're familiar with the temple. They're familiar with the scriptures. They know the prophecies regarding Messiah. And the Lord has fulfilled all the types and pictures of the Old Testament, all the prophecies as well. And yet they're not testifying to him. They're testifying against him. Again, the preposition is key. It was not in doubt whose side they were on. They were on their own side. They had made up their mind about the Lord Jesus Christ. No amount of evidence, no amount of miracles, no amount of signs could shake them from their assertion that Jesus was false and dangerous. And they were by no means going to acknowledge him, confess him, or bow the knee to him. Ironically, Isaiah 45, and it's referred to in Philippians 2, is going to point out that one day every knee is going to bow to the Lord Jesus Christ of things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And these chief priests and elders are going to have to do that. Even though many of them will be in hell on that day under the earth and cast into the lake of fire thereafter, they will still have to bow the knee and confess Jesus is Lord. They'll have to acknowledge this is the eternal Son of God, the creator and redeemer of the universe, and its rightful sovereign, the one who has every right to rule. And so they will have to submit to that authority, even though they don't willingly submit. They don't love the king. They don't kiss the son lest he be angry. They repudiate him and they gnash their teeth in hell. They're still angry. They're still hateful. They're still impenitent. They haven't repented. In other words, haven't changed their mind about Jesus. They hate him. They hate the truth. They hate God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And they are against him. Well, there's no future in that. That is the very height of lostness. 
because without God, everything worth having is taken from us. No light, no love, no goodness, no wisdom. All of these things are resident in God. They're all attributes of our maker. And if we don't know him, we're not going to have the benefit of these things for all eternity. We will just have misery, eternal conscious punishment, torment because of sin, because of choices we've made, and ultimately because we reject God the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So Pilate was really incredulous at this, that although they testified so much against him, he answered nothing. But then again in verse 14 we read, but he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. I'm sure he had presided over many different kinds of criminal cases and probably more than one capital case before, more than one case that would lead to the death penalty. And many people would plead for their freedom and maybe also plead for their lives. You know, they'd always have excuses. There'd always be extenuating circumstances. There would be alibis, real and imagined. And they would have a lot to say. Some would probably beg. Others would be angry and maybe curse him. But to see this calm, this stillness about the Lord Jesus, that he doesn't feel the need to argue and to dispute and to shout back in the faces of the priests and the elders, he doesn't have to do any of that. He just stands there silently. And it's a silent dignity that he exudes. Now, I am mindful that later in the book of Acts, we're told, I think it's Acts 6, that many of the priests became obedient to the faith. I've often wondered what it was that led those priests to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe some of them had been there when the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That happened when our Lord was crucified and when he gave up his spirit and died. But it could be, too, that there were some in this group, even there, watching the Lord in his uh, trials and seeing how he was accused and seeing the calm dignity with which he held himself, seeing the truthful way in which he spoke and even looked. And his countenance must have been something to behold. And even the judge, Pontius Pilate, is astonished at this, that he wouldn't be answering back. It says he marveled greatly. I'm sure it took a lot to shock a jaded and somewhat cynical Roman official like Pontius Pilate. But this was really surprising to him. He marveled greatly that the Lord Jesus wasn't pleading for his life. Well, small wonder, because the Lord told us that if we lose our life in this world for his sake, we would gain it for eternal life. And the Lord himself is the great forerunner in this. He wasn't living for the world as it now is. He came to this world to bear witness to his Father, to show them the Father and show us the Father. He came to destroy the works of the devil, including the sin of man, what the devil's temptation led to. And he came to destroy all that by paying for it by offering the right redemption price, giving his own life as depicted in the shedding of his blood, that sacrifice that paid for sin and that demonstrated God's holiness and righteousness and yet also opened a way for his mercy and grace to come to us and save us. And out of all that, the Lord Jesus was demonstrated to be one who loved not his own life even to death. Uh, we sing a hymn sometimes, Lord, even to death, thy love could go. And Philippians 2 says he was obedient unto the point of death, even the death of the cross. So the Lord Jesus wasn't trying to guard his life right now. He wasn't trying to hold on to things that he had while he walked upon this earth. Rather, he would give up his life in sacrifice. He lived his life, after all, on a daily basis for others. First of all, for his father to do his father's will. And then secondly, to give his life to serve others, to serve men and women, boys and girls, and ultimately going to the cross and giving his life in sacrifice to save us from our sins. So the world still marvels at this, the rich and the powerful, 
and the mean and the middle class, uh, everyone in between. We can't understand this kind of condescension, the way the Lord gave himself. But though we don't understand it, it doesn't make it any less true. The Lord lived every moment of his life on earth for the glory of his Father, for our good, and ultimately died on the cross so that we could be saved. Thankfully, he rose again from the dead, showing that death has no claim on him. It couldn't hold him. It wasn't possible for the bands of death to hold him, Peter said. But he rose up in triumph, and he offers eternal life to as many as will receive him by faith. So if you've never done that, I would invite you to call on the Lord Jesus and receive him by faith. It's the only hope you have, the only way you can be saved. And the alternative is to continue on lost until you go into the second death, being separated from him for all eternity. And that need not be. The Lord died and rose and ascended so that you could be saved, be saved today.